Good evening and welcome to our Spotlight Talk series. Uh, my name is Moira Anderson and I am a part of our public programs team here at Crystal Bridges. It's such an honor to welcome you all virtually for this conversation between artist Joyce J. Scott and Dr. Leslie King Hammond. Whether you're joining us here over Zoom or turn, tuning in through Facebook, we're thrilled to have this opportunity to bring the talk to an audience from all over the country. And of course, this opportunity wouldn't be possible without the generous support from our sponsors of the Spotlight Talk series, Del Monte Foods and Pure Gold Price Club Incorporated. We're so grateful for your continued support of all of our educational programs. You can continue to meet us here on Zoom for more lectures in our upcoming Spotlight Talk series, as we're going to continue featuring artists that are included in the Crafting America exhibition over the next coming months. You can find all that information about each of the talks on our website, including all the dates, the times, and the speakers. And also please share with your family and friends. I don't think that anybody should miss this opportunity to hear these fantastic conversations. For tonight, just a few housekeeping notes before we begin. If you wanna take advantage of our live captioning over Zoom, we are providing this through the CC icon on the bar located at the bottom of the screen. You can simply click the button and select the option to turn them on. And we'll also be collecting your questions and comments using the Q&A button. So please send them at any time during the lecture and we'll make sure to leave some time at the end to answer them. Tonight's talk, I am thrilled to welcome acclaimed artist Joyce J. Scott for a conversation that will give you just a glimpse of her prolific career as an artist. Joyce is a printmaker, a weaver, a sculptor, performance artist, and educator, but she's most well known for her work in jewelry, beadwork, and glass. Her art reflects her take on all aspects of American pop culture, her ancestry, and the immediate world of her neighborhood. And her pieces serve as a commentary for issues regarding race, politics, sexism, and stereotypes. Joyce received her BFA from the Maryland Institute College of Art and MFA from the Institute of Allende in Mexico. And she is also a MacArthur Fellow. Her work is in the collection of the Baltimore Museum of Art, Mint Museum of Craft and Design, the Spencer Museum of Art, and the Smithsonian American Art, among many others. And of course, if you are finding yourself visiting Crystal Bridges, you can come see some of her pieces included in our uh, current exhibition, Crafting America. Joining Joyce in conversation this evening is longtime friend and colleague, Dr. Leslie King Hammond. Leslie is an art historian and founding director of the Center for Race and Culture at the Maryland Institute College of Art. Born in the South Bronx, King Hammond grew up in South Jamaica and Hollis, Queens, New York. She attended Johns Hopkins University for doctoral studies in art history and served in leadership and board positions at many museum and cultural institutions, including the Reginald F. Lewis Museum of Maryland, African American History and Culture, the Lewis Museum and the Creative Alliance for the Artists in Baltimore, Maryland. Joyce, Leslie, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you this evening. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I would like to welcome everyone to this lecture, this conversation, this moment to contemplate exactly what it is like to live in the neighborhood with an artist, to have an artist as a friend, and also to recognize that there was an artist who was beginning to make paramount statements with her work as I was just coming out of grad school, having finished my doctorate. One day I was on the campus of Johns Hopkins University. Yes, I'm going to tell that story. And I'm walking through the campus and they're having their annual arts festival. And here in the middle of the festival where every artist has paid for a table, every vendor has located themselves. I see this young woman sitting between two tables with a very large case. So in those days, you know, it's very rare to see black artists anywhere and to see them on Hopkins campus because I myself as a graduate student was something of an anomaly. I went over to see what was going on and what she had. And there were some of the most 
fascinating pieces of jewelry. True. There were necklaces. Mm hmm and, and, and earrings uh, made out of found objects, buttons and beads and pearls. And, and I just, I was just amazed. Well, I began to pick out a few things and at the same time, I'm curious. So I begin to ask her a few questions about where did she live and how did she come up with the idea of doing this and what else does she do? And immediately, as you will see in a moment, she began to gave, give me this song and this dance performance about how she was a single parent and she had four or five children. She had on this wild wig as one would see now. And she, and I just looked at her and I said, mm -hmm. I already realized that she was a performance artist in the midst of an improvisation and that I was witnessing the evolution of an artist who was determined to make a statement about who they were and where they were in the world. All right, fast forward two months. I'm sitting out in the front house, uh, in front of my house in Baltimore. We have row houses with marble steps. And my husband at the time is a antique car collector and he's on the street watching, doing his ritual washing of the car. Who comes walking down the street but Joyce Scott? And he looks up and he says, oh, hi, Joyce. And I go, you know her? He says, yeah, we were in school together. I went, oh my God. So then, as fate would have it, Joyce and I immediately began to talk and we be immediately became bonded and we immediately began to exchange all kinds of information and all kinds of hilarity. And my husband used to claim that every time I went out with her, I was more uncontrollable than, was, than I was when I left. And so as time went on, his jealousy rose because we became stronger friends. And I began to learn a lot about what it is like to have come from a creative family and also begin to question how the currency and politics of the time began to impact on us all so greatly but how Joyce began to use that, to mine it, to harvest it, and turn it into this fantastical, magnificent body of work. So with this, Joyce, it's your turn. It's my turn. I thought we were gonna say more wonderful things about me, but that's okay, Leslie. Thank you very much for telling people that I told those lies when I was a young woman. And you did. <laughs> Thank you very much. Megan, would you put the slides on, please? Or you might have to, Megan, uh, double in. That's the lady who's working the slides. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be here today with my partner in crime, Leslie, Dr. Leslie King Hammond. We can go past the unplug, please, Megan. We'll go, ah, there you go. I'd also like to say hi to all my friends, my gallery folks, Amy Raish, who or Rache, who is the gallerist, at my Baltimore Gallery, Goya Contemporary, and Martha Max Con the young. Okay. This is a picture of me and my mom, me and my dad when we were young and innocent. You know how long ago that was. Next. The next you're gonna see pictures of my father's mother and father. Charlie Scott Sr. and Mamie Scott. Now the thing about them is that they were in North Carolina. They picked tobacco and it was a, a hard life for them. And in those days, one of the artistic pursuits that happened for my grandma was quilt making next. Now, when people look at her quilts, they say, I understand what you're saying. These are wonderful. And these are typical African-American works of art. And I don't know if it's true that any ethnic group actually has typical work, but I understand what they mean because people always talk about this kind of work having a kind of syncopation, a improvisational feeling. Now, in those days, quilts were much cheaper than blankets. So people 
made utilitarian quilts as well as beautiful quilts. Next. This is my mother's father, Samuel Caldwell, and he had as many jobs as he had children. He had 14 children. He used to race horses and he sold white lightning, which is not an ethnic group. It's a drink. And he worked on the railroad and they were cotton pickers. They were sharecroppers. And he was a quilt maker. And I, I show this quilt because it talks about an asymmetry. When my grandfather wanted to dye fabric, he waded in the water and got some yellow ochre clay. And they didn't throw away layers when an old quilt started to get sad and needed help. They just put a new layer on it. That's why you see tatters and torn at the bottom. Next. And this is his wife, Mary Jane Caldwell, the person who had all of those kids. So she wasn't picking a lot of cotton. She made a lot of utilitarian quilts like this, made out of big pieces of fabric. Sometimes they went to the mills that got the cotton that they picked and bought fabric from them. A lot of times, so they did these kind of story quilts. I call them diaries for preliterate people because many times they didn't read or write and they couldn't put that many names in the Bible. So they take a piece of fabric like from Uncle Benny, his pants, and they'd say, these are Uncle Benny's quilts. You don't know this? That's not dirt, that's Uncle Benny's knee print. And when he was bending down trying to make his victory garden, because we were always trying to get sweet tomatoes and he never had sweet tomatoes. You don't know him, his daughter's a slut. Now Uncle Benny, and they keep talking and tell you the history of your family when they couldn't write it in a book. Now, my mother dragged this quilt from South Carolina, and as it happens, your parents blame you for everything. My mom said I tore it up, and when she said you ought to fix that quilt, she really told me to write on it. She said write on it. Back to a diary, meaning stitch it, and if you love it, you ought to put a new page to the book. So that's that folded fabric, a new quilt layer. This goes right to the idea of these quilts being diaries and stories written about your past and your future next. Then we get to my mom, Elizabeth Caldwell Talford Scott, that light that perpetually shines whether she's under the ground or in the sky. That's the 50 year quilt. She taught me how to quilt on it and it took her 50 years to do it from fabric she brought with her from the South and the great migration all the way to her finishing it in like the 60s. Next, my mom was a rebel. She didn't believe that she should have to follow the rules, right? So when she wanted to make something like the prayer cloth on the left, on the, on, I guess, our right, she would take buttons and beads and rocks and stones and make knots and big stitches, little stitches, you name it, because she felt that this had some kind of consistent and ever, ever, everlasting power. So you put it on your tummy or lean against it and it would help you feel better. The other is the quilt that's owned by the Delaware Museum. Boy, am I talking fast and it's because we only have 90 minutes and Leslie cuts me out before this time and told me not to waste anything. <gasps> it's called Grandfather's Cabin and at the bottom there are these squiggly lines you can see they were snakes. Mom said every year this snake who lived under the house would come and knock on the door, knock, knock, knock. And her father would pull out the shotgun, kick the door open, boom, and there'd be nothing left but the snake skin at the bottom. So this is whole story, quilting the stars in the sky in the grandfather's cabin. And that's how I learned about my family's stories next. Now, when my mom stopped working so much, and when she met my gaggle of friends, Leslie King Hammond, included, we started seeing how precious this work was. This is long before the G's Ben's quilts and, and all the other wonderful quilters who are working today got some prominence. So Leslie, Lowry Sims, Patterson Sims, other curators, George Sissel were important in helping us see that my mother had the real possibility of showing her work to others. You can see there's a lot of stitching and cutting together stories, just like the way we would tell stories. Because we, we tell stories like this. You know, when you came home, you were seven, but you weren't only seven years old. You had that blue dress. You still have the blue dress? Well, I was drinking uh, wine that I made out of strawberries. You don't like strawberries, do you? All of those desperate kinds of feelings and stories and rhythms are put together in her work. Next. 
And then we're talking about a quilt that's made out of ties. Folks would like do homage to my mother and bring her articles to put in her work. And someone brought her bags of ties once and she made this marvelous wall hanging. Next. And what did, what did that mean to me? Well, people say, when did you become an artist? And I say in utero. I came out of the, my mom's womb and I looked at the doctor and said, boom, you're in my life, but boom, boom. I was smoking to get, okay, I, old jokes. This is a young audience probably. I was sure I was going to be a painter, but when I went to the Maryland Institute College of Art, I was disabused of that and told to stop painting for the betterment of myself and the entire human race. That was actually so. So what I did was take the passport my mother had given me. I always thought I was gonna be a teacher. When I got into education studies, you had to do everything. And I was right back doing many of the things that my mother and her ancestors had taught her teaching me. The true passport was needle and thread. And I traveled the world using needle and thread as my passport, my, my special introductory song to people, learning from them and showing them what my prowess was. Next. I was a weaver for years, years and years of weaving. I hated hated warping looms. And so I tried to, you know, warp anything besides being in a loom and counting all the dents and everything. I realized, cause this was like hippie times, that what I was really trying to get into is translucency. And when you work with fibers, the light is absorbed into or bounces off and that's not translucing. So that was the beginning of my life as a bead worker. Next. For me, beadwork is working with translucency. It's light flowing through and it's also mathematics. It's pointillism. It's my ability to take a color that already exists, a texture that already exists and blend it together as Surat did when he was doing pointillism. And it's dry and I can afford to buy it and I can make wonderful things out of it. I'm stopping there. Yes, Leslie King Hammond, a very nice person. I know you haven't seen that yet, but uh, oops. Okay, yes, let's, let's go back to the double screen, please. Yes. My hair's still good? Okay. Yes, I'm you're stunning, up. you're stunning. Okay, and my necklace, my necklace. All right, I I'm wearing, that isn't it right. beautiful? Ugh. Yes, it's stunning. It's stunning. You don't know what I had to do to get it, but it's stunning. Um, <clears throat> Joyce, Joyce's work has had so many evolutions. It's been like almost kaleidoscopic in its uh, um, vast investigation of materials and responses. Um, as Joyce talked, through the narrative of her history. You heard a lot of performative work. And one of the things I remembered because I, I have a son who's in 41 and I met Joyce before oh. he was born and she became one of the godmothers. And while we were in this process, I got to watch every phase. By the time the 80s came, Joyce began to do performances. And I was confused in a sense because, you know, I was trained in the Western iconic tradition of art history. And, but at the same time, I'm dealing with an African centered aesthetic that is beginning to emerge in our country because it is also paralleling itself at the time that feminism is emerging, as well as the Black Arts Movement is flourishing, as well as the culture wars are coming to the fore. So I say to Joyce, what's up? She began a series, the Thunder Thigh Review, absolutely uproarious. Joyce, tell us about that phase. What was in your head? What, what gave rise to that? What did you tell me when I asked you, why the hell are you getting on stage prancing around in a corset with a friend 
and Gorgeous. taking all kinds of props. Gorgeous. Well, Leslie, you know, I've kind of always been a performer. And when Whoopi Goldberg and Kathy mm -hmm. and Mo and all these folks mm -hmm. got on stage and said, you could be you and talk about yourself and someone will listen. Now, I I've been raised with Jack Benny and Mort Saul and all these other monologists, Jewish comics on. That's why I'm wearing my wonderful Jewish woman now. I can ask this right now, everybody. I've been raised with that. And, and then, you know, all, uh, Pygmy Markham and all of these other folks. Mom's also made what I was raised with as a child. I mean, mm -hmm. if you were sitting at a table anywhere, kitchen table somewhere with a bunch of older African-American men and women, then you were having shtick all the time. And why, why did he come in? Hey, yo, bow-legged, peanut-looking head with little Negro ears, and that's the wrong hat. And we're like, oh, you said that, and he comes, oh, what's wrong with you? Uh, it, it was always that kind of comedic sleight of hand and terpsichore that I loved and realized that it was a true way of communicating to people. It was the trickster. I talk about the trickster a lot because the trickster is the one who can say sometimes truly abhorrent things, but not lose his or her head. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. because the truth is enfolded in it. In fact, that's my job. Working with Kayla Wall as the two thunder thighs. <laughs> and I want you to know some, that was in the eighties. And sometimes some old guy will drive by in a car in Baltimore and yell at me, hey thighs. I'm like, my God. And then I realized how, you know, laudatory that is and I feel great. Anyway, this was a period when everybody was doing performance. This was the 60s, 70s, where you were experimenting with just about anything you could do. So you would do an installation and that couldn't be it. There had to be somebody singing in it or drawing or dancing in it. Uh, there were promenades. It, it was really a way to affect a total experience. And that had always been it within the African community, certainly church in a Pentecostal church where I was raised, that's what it was about. Mm -hmm. uh, I tell people, and this is true, that I used to do street ministry with my godparents who were the ministers of our church. And of course I got them all a lot more money because I was so good looking. I played the tambourine, <laughs> I say. Anyway. It was also, I think when I look back, cause I'm 72 now, I know black don't crack, but I'll stop. I realized that it was a way for me to work out my zest, my demons, my angels in a way that the visual arts could not afford me. Mm -hmm. There's a real difference between performance and visual arts. Firstly, it's first person, you're there, you're being it. And especially if you're talking about issues that are important to you or that are ever present, that people are right there involved in themselves, it has a meaning. When you do visual work, you're usually not there at the museum saying, may I ask your questions for you? And the person has to make decisions on their own. So doing both these things allowed me to be in somebody's face and in another part of the world, making artwork someplace and not bothering people. Um, because of that, it allowed me to evolve as someone who was ever ready, but also constantly examining the kind of work that I was doing. And also knowing that for me, there was a difference between the visual and the performing work, because mm -hmm. there is a difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is very true. But at the time that you were doing this, there were very mixed reactions. I remember that Early on in, in my career and the career of uh, Lowry Sims um, and Patterson Sims and George Sissel, uh, when we began to recognize that you were making important statements about defining the agency of blackness and, and the heritage and the legacies of cultures, and more importantly, the relationship of family and the connectivity to community became very difficult. I remember vividly giving a lecture once in Chicago and I remember talking about Elizabeth Scott's quilts and I made the parallel that these quilts were as brilliant as anyone else who had just received an MFA. 
and they had to get me a cab so that I could get out the museum because people rushed the stage to cuss me out because really, really I probably didn't tell you this, but they, they had to rush me out because people were so irate. They were so conditioned to think that anyone who had an innate talent, uh, an innate genius to create work, you understand? could even supersede those individuals who had gone through the academic circuit. And what I was trying to say was, is that there is a brilliance out here that we are not recognizing, that we are not paying attention to. And I, in my educational experience coming through Hopkins and the classicism of that experience, got a different kind of education by as a young adult growing up in the house with you and Mother Scott and you abusing me. I yes. don't know how abusive it was. I think it was a kind of initiation, which you're still going to get, Lowry Sims. Yeah, you know, initiate because you're like Bayesian. You have that Caribbean negritude. But this was Baltimore. It was a whole new scene for Leslie. You know, she came down, she went to get her doctorate, the whole thing. But when we bum rushed her, it was, it was wonderful. I feel good about it to this day. Can we have the start of the slides again, please, Megan, double in? Because we have to now move into the contemporary work because you are a kaleidoscopic individual. I certainly am. When you put me in like in front of light, all kinds of things flash off me. But that also could just be that I was drinking that day. But that's a whole other story. The piece on the left is a necklace uh, that's in the exhibition at Crystal Bridges now. And the other is a large necklace that I made last year. Next. Uh, let me tell you about why I do jewelry. It's very important to me to get you in on the game. I like the idea that a person who wears the work has now submitted to wearing something that's going to cause interaction whether they want it or not. And so sometimes my necklaces are about lynching and rape and slayings and they have sometimes uh, curse words or words that are insulting in them. And I'm always surprised that people actually wear them and are inviting that kind of uh, contretemps, that kind of uh, interaction with people. I want to tell you about the one on the left side, the one with all the stripes and lines. I sent that to Michelle Obama. And I hadn't heard from them in a year. And I thought someone in the kitchen is cooking where that necklace. Michelle Obama has not received that necklace. Michelle is all of that. And I know if she had it, she would have talked to me personally on the phone by now. You know, you lied to yourself. Well, not long after I called my friend and said, can you check? I got a form letter from her and it was very nice. I think I still have it somewhere. I'm sure I must. And in it, she said something about connecting, which I knew that Michelle Obama did not want to meet me, but I thought she was just trying to get a, you know, a pair of matching earrings with this necklace, Michelle Obama. I, I know you. Next. These are really new necklaces uh, made in 2020. They're really large fairy tale pictorial necklaces. And I defy people to tell me that I wouldn't use the same impulse, the same maneuvers and gut feelings that I use to make these pieces that I do when I'm painting, no matter how bad my paintings are. These are very large pectorals neck pieces. They're meant to make you not walk by the person, not see them on the other side of the room. They're meant for you to walk flat-footed right up to that person and become involved in these stories. I don't know why else I'm on this earth. I mean, I know uh, people have all kinds of ideas about who they are and what they do. I knew that I wanted to be an artist that made a difference. And I was blessed enough to find a medium and my metier, my my form in beadwork. It was not only something that I could use to make the work, but it was something that I could help to evolve as a technique 
and also help to be seen as a valid, valid form. Because, you know, people still think of beadwork as like that kind of handicraft thing that people do, although it has been revered since the beginning of time. I mean, when you open up a grave, you always see beads around someone's neck. So it became, once again, my passport. My first bead year teacher was my mom who taught me when I was around five. Next. I like to make money off what I sell and I like to collaborate sometimes. So these are earrings that I made with Shana Croix and Lauren Schott because I'm not a metal worker. Next. Sometimes my series talk about, and this is an old from an old series, talk about, uh, hard subject. So this is from the sexual objectification series. This is about a woman who wants something, but society says she can't have it. So she's hiding it under her skirts. Next. My mother had many jobs and one was as a nanny. She told me the most uh, difficult thing for her was to be called by a small child, a kid who's much too young to go to the club or to be out running and jogging to be called the N-word. And so I have made a whole series about the relationship between nannies and their children and the children they raise. And somehow, sometimes they become the same people. Next. I like to talk about what's existing in the world, not just the horrors that white people do to black people or people of color, but also the things that we do to ourselves. So this is from the uh, four series where, the day after rape really series. And this is a Darfur section where women would leave the immigrant camps to look for water and be slain and placed in odd positions so people could see them or left with their children. Next. Okay, now we're getting into the super contemporary work. I was working with like tiny beads and I thought, now I've got these stories and fairy tales to talk about. Excuse me, they're coming right out of me. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna use these small precious beads to make grandiose statements. This is a, uh, a piece about Harriet Tubman and the walk she made. She's from Maryland, I'm from Maryland. She made me and my relationship with my mother made me really think about how my mother was like Harriet Tubman. Next. It's another wall hanging. It's a blue baby book. Sometimes I'll cut up things and reuse them. I had pages from a book I made, I think in a 70s or early 80s and I already made a piece with a blue lady giving birth and the book was called the blue baby book so I made this very very large wall hanging combining the two using very small beads for bead workers 10s and 11s and sometimes 15s you know what I have enough ego shut up Leslie to say <laughs> that I really want people to look at my work and say who the hell would do something like this? It's magnificent. What kind of person would spend their life doing this? And I want to raise my hand and say, what? Next. This is the latest tall wall hanging I did. It's called, I say fairy tale and Amy calls it something else that will come to me. Uh, it's a really, really tall piece. I think it's around 45 or 43 inches tall. And it's all about this woman and the different people in her lives. Next, I'm moving fast. Glass. I can say that there, there is a growing population of African-American glass artists who work with blown glass. There's always been African-American representation in the glass arts. Many times it was not only glass blowers, but it was uh, artists who didn't have to have such all of these giant materials, you know, like a furnace and everything. 
So they would do glass by stained glass work or by assembling glass with glues and other things. My gallery said to me in 2016, I believe, to my mom passed, and I think after I had my knee operation, and what do you want to do with your life? And I said, I want to be in a Venice Biennale. And they said, okay. So I had two residencies at the Beringo Glass Studio in Italy. And I was on two satellite exhibitions in the Venice Biennale. I'd worked with many American glass blowers around the country. You can imagine what a shock it was for them when I walked in wearing a lot of velvet, a giant red wig and singing. I thought Italians love opera. I got to give them some of this. Well, by the second residency, they figured out that I was just the right amount of mentally ill and that I'm an uncertified multiple personality and that's just fine. And we worked with glass together. This is a series, the Buddha series. I'd use Buddhas for a long time because I like that there's a guy, an average guy who decided to change his life so that he could be enlightened. Next. I also use African sculptures sometimes because I don't know why I should reinvent a wheel. This is a war woman piece. She's wearing a, a glass heart, a glass blown heart that's covered with flames as a backpack. And she's standing on the heads of people and penises and guns and dice uh, cover the base talking about the luck of the draw in war next. And that's a large piece. This headshot is about how guns are so easily procured and used by young men and how their heads are blown off, how their lives are ended. Next. This is Harriet Tubman as Buddha. And these are made with large pony beads. When I did an exhibition at Grounds for Sculpture, it was called uh, Harriet Tubman and Other Truths. It was curated by Lowry Sims and Patterson Sims. Two crazy twins. You don't even want to know the dirty stories I know about them. I thought if we're talking about enlightened person, we're talking about Harry Tubman. No, she was a spy, guys. This woman couldn't read or write, but she was a spy. She also died impoverished with not a lot of money. So I decided to do her as Buddha next. This piece is very large. It's around, I think, 36, 40 inches tall. She's holding a rosary out of stones that was made by my mother. Next. And I made so much glass in Italy. And I have to say this to you. I didn't blow the glass. And many times artists don't blow the glass. They just tell people what to do. They make uh, drawings and we work together. And I did beadwork the whole time. They were working with me so I know what I might add. I have one of my storage rooms filled with glass because I make so much. So when I came home and they sent the glass home, I cobbled together, glued and worked. I did work with the McFadden Glass Studio here to really use a great glue. And I made these uh, large dimensional pieces. That one's probably around 30 and 28, 30 inches tall. Next, I think it's the next view, the back of this. And you can see me being my mom right here, my mom's baby. You can't tell me what to do. I put all that what I want to put on it. I, I make it the way I want to make it. Uh, if you don't like it, well, that's too bad. Next. <laughs> Same thing. I thought, I bet. I haven't seen this done this way. So I'm gonna put African sculpture on top of a glass sculpture and then add some more beadwork to it. Next. Things are double-sided. I've also fused glass and fused beadwork in it and painted and you can't tell me what to do. Now I want you to know that sometimes when I would work with glass artists, they were like, here she goes. Because they have their own there are many who 
are much more conservative in what they add to glass work. But I say to everyone, I'm not a glass artist. I'm an artist who uses glass as one of my materials. And I can tell you, I have been rewarded by working with these glass artists. And the majority of them are always like, you crazy? Let's get to work. <laughs> Next. This one was blown in Italy and I, I fused some beadwork on the face and I did bead a beaded snake when I became, when I got home and you gotta remember guy, I'm working with men, classic Italian glass blowers. And I said, she's gonna be pulling this out of her vagina. She's having a baby. And they're like, my God, uh, yeah, yeah. And this is a big one. We made the legs separately and glued them on later and they were so proud after they made it. Next. This is a woman giving birth. You can see the embryo in the body. And then I did something that I hadn't seen before. And I thought, well, why not? So I mosaic beadwork and glass together and, and made the base. Uh, I bought a flower pot out of metal. It was too weak. I went to Paul Daniel, Linda Palmer's husband and said, can you help me? He did. He made it stronger and then I could put all kinds of work on it. I had a close friend named Thomas Miller, who is a wonderful artist here in Baltimore. And we used to make jokes about Negro carpentry. carpentry. We weren't trained carpenters, but I, I learned about wood in school and so did he. So we just talk about how we would jerry rig things to make it work. And I did. Next. I also have a floor mosaic at the, um, I guess it's the Ronald Reagan airport. Mm -hmm. I tell people to go see it because this will be one of the few times you'll ever be able to walk on me. <laughs> Next. Next, Megan, wake up, Megan's drinking. I know this is going so slowly because it's like eight o'clock, 8.30, Megan is drinking alcohol. Megan will talk later. So when I talk to you about the Grounds for Sculpture show, they stupidly ask me, so Joyce, what do you wanna do? And I said, really? And they said, yeah, I wanna make a 15 foot sculpture of Harriet Tubman out of dirt and I want it to disappear in time. And they said, well, we think we could do 13 feet, 15 feet. And I wanted to be holding a giant glass gun. And I said to Lowry, Lowry even said, what? And we're gonna put graffiti on the side. We're gonna spray paint her just like she was, you know, on a wall, it's dirt. Can't we do it? And I'm gonna embed glass beads in it. There is Harriet Tubman and she's surrounded by the plants that she would have had to traverse through from South Carolina to get to Maryland and all the way up to Canada. Next. Next. Now Megan is mad at me because I said this. Here's the, nope, not that one, go back. Wait. So the one that you're going to go back to, thank you, Megan. I'm making jokes, Megan. Stop, you know. <laughs> this is the Harriet Tubman that's around, that's I think around 10 feet tall. So we, they did anything I asked them to do. They were silly and that made me feel good. She's wearing a, a, a dress and it's really styrofoam that's been bronze. She's got a long glass gun as well. And she's carrying a veve, a beaded kind of, power stick and those quilts you see on the ground were made by my father's mother. And uh, I used them because quilts were very important in uh, the under Underground Railroad. They were used as signs of entry or keep going, it's not safe. Next. I know they that I talked to you about my being a, a painter and I tell you, I think there's a lot of crappy painting out here now, and since I'm a really crappy painter, I should start painting because I could probably sell it. The closest I get to it is printmaking. This is a handmade paper piece I made years ago that just sold, may I add, 
and that's one of my prints. Next. I work here generally at the um, Soul Print Studio, Soledad Solane. I started doing prints when Obama was the president and they made jokes about his ears. And so here Obama is as Buddha once again. Next. I like the idea about doing prints that harken back to something archaic or ancient, but have contemporary references. So this is the, uh, the uh, Hip Hop Book of the Dead series. So that's Biggie Small with his wife, Faith Evans, and his mistress, Lil' Kim. And uh, these are different emblems uh, that talk about the period in which he lived. Next. I'm ending up with performance. That's Kayla Wall and I on the left. She is now Kayla Wall Muhammad. When we were the Thunder Thigh Reviews, see how young and tasty we were. And then after that, I worked with a group called uh, Honey Child Milk, which was actually a coon show, guys. And it was a musical. Next, I did for years some performance on my own. It was really, really my having the hubris and the ego that made me think I could do it. That's when I realized I'm an entertainer and not an actress or director. I still do performances. One person that I work with is Lorraine Whittlesey. We're called Ebony and Irony. This is from one of our performances. Next. Sometimes I will work with young artists. Here I'm working with Jasmine. She's a singer, has her own band, and a hip-hop artist, spoken word artist. Next. I don't know how this happened, but I am working with a Tuvan group. This is a Russian group of, of <laughs> Tuvan performers who are indigenous to their own culture, and they do their own music and body. The guy with the white letters on his T-shirt decided that he wanted to make a, his own one person contemporary album. So I, with these other performers, are working on the, on his album. Next. There's one performer who's not in this and that's, he's my impresario, Derek Thompson. He plays for me consistently, a wonderful, pianist and a wonderful musician. And I'm gonna end with this. And Leslie, then we can talk, but let me end with this one. That's a picture of my mom and I before she passed. My mother transitioned 14 years with uh, dementia, coming from someone who started to lose her, her memory and eventually could not talk and could not walk, but was always alert to me. My mom used to always tell me about the light, this very bright light. She told me I had it. I believe we all do in some variation. My parents used to tell me in the South, they'd say, don't hide your light under a bushel. That meant don't let others take this great power that you have from you because they don't like that you're a woman or that you're uh, African-American, or that you're fat, or you have gappy teeth, or that you are as smart or sometimes smarter than them. So I say to folks, I got this light and I'm gonna use it. My family ate shite so I could have sugar. I shall not be denied. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine. Thank you very much. And thank you, Megan, you were wonderful. She's gonna write me such a letter about my yelling at her. Oy. Yes, Leslie, what do you wanna know? Or are there questions?
No, the question should be, what should I not let them know out of everything that you have delivered? This has been but the tip of the iceberg of what a Joyce Jane Scott is wait, about. Wait, wait, did you say the tit of an iceberg? Tip. tip. I don't do that kind of work anymore, Leslie. <laughs> I'm too fat to do the poll. When I get, when I on the poll, this is what you hear. <laughs> it's my cellulite script. <laughs> okay. One of the things that give Joyce a moment to catch her breath. One of the <laughs> things that Joyce has not talked about and that I want her to talk about after I allow her to catch her breath is her role in her relationship with her community of artists and other creatives. While Joyce is intensely prolific, um, in fact, just last night and into the wee hours of the morning, we were chastising her for not taking care of her precious hands because they are the tools for her brain and her vision. And she has been beating relentlessly through this pandemic in ways that have just marveled uh, and staggered our imagination in what she has been able to do under quarantine. She and I are both of the age where we're high risk. And so we have to be hypersensitive and ultra cautious. Yeah, but, but you're yes, much older than I am. Yes, I am. I'm the bigger sister, years. even though you're the bad sister. So many years. See, see. So with that, Joyce is, is, is one of those individuals, remarkable. And I think this in part goes to why she was the recipient of the MacArthur Award. And that is that while Joyce is totally committed, if not obsessed about her own work and messaging and telling the narratives and stories of all the histories that engage and incite her, she is constantly engaged with the question of what all the other artists in her community are doing. She is prodding, poking, encouraging, nurturing, nursing, nagging, getting on your damn living nerves because, That's see, see, <laughs> because she expects that you, whomever you are, are to rise to the level of your excellence. And she will not stop until you do that, until you get that connection within yourself. And this is a remarkable thing. I've known her forever, all right? Forever and ever and ever. It's almost as if it was destined, kismet, that we were to meet. But our views and our commitments are very parallel. So I want Joyce to talk about some of the ways and some of the things that she does. Like at the time that we had the horrendous incident with Freddie Gray in the city of Baltimore and people were just absolutely, totally in a state of madness, craziness, grief, trauma, you name it. And this was long before the Black Lives Matters movement. This is long before all of the movements that we are having to deal with now. Joyce, tell them what you did in your community. Well, I will. Let me give a little before that, the idea of what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. I really realized, and it was something that I was always taught through my family, that you're not alone in this, and there's absolutely no way for you to proceed unless you're with others and unless they're with you going through whatever door you open and you go through the doors they open for you. It just, especially for people of color and women, it just is very, very harder. And so like you're, people are asking you to break through the glass and you're, yeah, but who's supposed to clean that up? Not me, right? So I literally lived around the corner from the CBS that was set alight during uh, the different uprisings uh, during after the death of Freddie Gray. And I, I want you to know that Freddie Gray, Freddie Gray died in the neighborhood that I was raised in, in the, right across the street from the projects where I used to live. I lived across the street from the projects. 
So I looked out my window one day and I saw the preachers in a circle praying for the area. Uh, the fire department used the, the fire hose uh, on my street. I mean, it was that close. And I thought, if I'm upset, what are the young kids in this neighborhood, in my block, feeling? So I went around to the houses and said, I'm going to do a jewelry class, fun class on Saturday. You don't have to do anything but come. I'll supply everything. And they were like, yeah. And the kids were like, yeah. And of course, Friday, I went around. Everybody was asleep. So I did have someone come, but I didn't do this alone. Uh, Leslie King Hammond was there. Gracie Johnson was there. And Gracie is a jeweler who owns her own jewelry shop and who was in the service and a psychologist. Was there one other person there? Leslie, one other adult. No, it was, it was the three of us. The three of us. We got very few people, but they came and we just kept making jewelry. Yeah. And these young girls would ask questions. In fact, one of them was a mentee of mine for a while. She took materials and she made jewelry and she sold it in school and it was good. There was one of the young girls who made a joke about, I don't know, I think, Maybe I'll go in service. Maybe I'll go on the block. And like it's all women like, oh, no, you didn't. And Gracie, who had been in the service, stepped mm -hmm. right up and talked about what a difference it made for her, especially with discipline. And it allowed her to go to school mm -hmm. and who she was today. And then later on, a little girl came in and we did a little bit with her and gave her material. All I can say was, I was so very happy that that happened. And it didn't happen at my house. I asked Carter, the, the mayor of Woodbrook Avenue, the street on which I live, if he would lend me a room in one of his houses, because he has a lot of houses. And he did, and he put a table and he added lighting just for us so that we could work within that community setting. That made a, a real difference. I, I received a, um, a residency at the Motor House, which is a art center and a performance space, you name it, in Baltimore. I was the first artist in residence. You had a three-year residency at the time and they gave me a stipend. I was so happy. Unfortunately, I didn't get to exploit it as much as I'd like to because right after I got it, I got the MacArthur, which meant I was doing a lot more traveling. Anyway. We used my studio, not only for me to work, but a graduate student came and she finished her work and she was doing an outside piece. So people came in, Olita Devane, you name it. We came in and helped her do that. And then I would put together a group of jewelers and we'd come in and we'd make stuff and we'd talk about stuff. Cause I had the space and with my stipend, my stipend, I'd buy supplies so people could do things as well as them bringing in stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff and his wife, Aisha, next door were photographers. We'd go in there and take pictures, you name it. We used the space. Leslie set up uh, jewelry sales and Christmas sales. And all I can say was that outreaching with my community and going back to my alma mater, Micah, and doing things if people needed it. Uh, Clyde would say, Joyce, they're having a fashion show. And these kids, they don't exactly know how to put together. So I'd come and I'd work with them. And one of the students, Amir, I, I did like this bing, 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 that's beadwork. You won't even believe what happened. We still are in contact. And we were asked, to, I was asked to come to talk about racism at a church downtown. And I said, I would like to bring him with me and you have to pay him. And we talked about intergenerational the intergenerational strife that happens. Uh, I sing a lot and I, I volunteer some, not as much as many others do, but folks know they can call on me and, and, and I like to be able to give and the MacArthur allowed me, it's over folks, so don't ask for anything to help me with folks in school or would help with a scholarship or something. Oh, and also, a group of us called Santa Mamas get together once a year. This between eight or 15 women. 
depending upon yep. what's happening, who's in town. And we provide Christmas to between two and four families every year. And to see a little kid get a bicycle and to see their parents, because many times there's a husband and a wife lost their job and can't afford presents for their children. To see that nose makes mm -hmm. us know that we've invented our own trickle down theory. We are sending out these tentacles in the community just the way I was taught by my godparents and my parents about being responsible within your community to artists as well as just to the Joe, the average Joe. Another thing we used to do is any food that was left that was edible, we take it out and give it to homeless folks. Linda and De Palma and I had this regular guy who liked us because we always brought him exotic food. <laughs> I'm just saying to you that Wait, and, and involved in that was one night I left, somebody put my bag in one of these, you know, big bags of food and I didn't have my keys and I didn't have any credit cards but my eyeglasses, my keys and everything were in that bag. And we gave it to the homeless guy. And the next day, Linda and Jim went out looking for this guy and they found him. And he said, uh, oh, I gave that food to another person who was hungrier than me. And they're like, oh gosh, we'll never be able. He said, oh, but that guy, remember these are homeless people that folks think are villains and dastardly. Oh, that guy though brought back her purse and in it were my eyeglasses and my keys. He took the $20, which I understand immediately. And there was another piece of something that was important to me, but to no one else. And I got my purse back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, I just want you to know that uh, I'm just one of a number. Baltimore is filthy with visual performance literary artists. Uh, and, and we all support each other in the ways that we can because this is a city that's going through and has been for a long time, a great deal of strife. Mm -hmm. Did mm -hmm. that answer it, Young? Yes, you, you were a little long-winded, but that's okay. Oy! I tell you all the time with the nibbling on me and the thing, I will talk to her after this. I will. Okay. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. Question from the from the peanut gallery. And did you know that the peanut gallery was a racial thing? <laughs> peanut galleries where poor black people sat. Yo. Of course. Of it's course. inculcated in of our course. Culture. Um, I'm gonna ask for a little help from uh, Moira because I don't see anything in the chat. This might be a tech thing. Maybe my end of the Zoom chat is not giving me anything. But if you see anything, can you just pipe in? If not, I will just carry on with um, Joyce. We do have uh, we do have a couple of questions, and Leslie, I'm going to copy and paste them over to the chat for you. But how about one of the things that um, came through is uh, Joyce? What are some of the things that you still want to do in art or in life? You know, I've been thinking about that because I, I it, when I became seventy, I thought I'm still young, I'm fabulous. When I turned seventy-two, I thought I'm going to die. I really got gobsmacked by the idea that I was no longer middle-aged. I was so far away from middle age. And I thought about what I could do. Well, certainly I made a decision to give my friends birthday presents. And another thing I decided to do is to use up as much of the materials that I have in my house as possible. For years, I'd see a sale or I'd see something or somebody would give me stuff. And I have my mother's materials still. So I've decided to be on this quest to use as much of that as I possibly can. And I want to consistently be this artist who, who takes beadwork and I want people to say, is that even possible? And I just want to say, yeah, I did it. <laughs> I want to go back to quilting. I've been threatening to put my loom up again, but actually I don't know if I'm going to do that as much as I'm going to do some beading and crochet projects together. I want to live, I'm going to keep singing. That's what I've been doing instead of theater work. I want to keep singing and I, I want to live. 
is what I want to do. I want to get through this perilous time, not be emotionally bereft. I want to take care of myself and stop overworking and being a crazy person. And I want to live long enough to pursue these dreams that I have. You know, I want to be a, a good human being. I want to be a solid citizen. I want to be with my friends and be happy with them and my family. I have two sisters and two brothers and all of their kids. I, I want to know that my living has not been in vain. What's the next one? I have a good, well, I have a, a few questions here that are very interesting uh, from our chat room. Um, who is your ideal wearer of your jewelry? Anyone who can afford to buy it. Oops, was that too, Chris? I actually don't have one. I don't have one because I, I think when you put it on, you, you are emboldened and you imbue it with whatever you are. I don't, like, you know, we say that and, you know, I don't know if I want a bunch of racists uh, wearing my necklaces. I, I don't know, but I haven't put those kind of parameters on it. Once I did, I did work on the sexual objectification of African-American men. And I made these black penises. And when I asked about it, they, they were not being bought by any black people. And one guy said to me, I just collect penises. Oh, I'm thinking, I think I'm gonna stop <laughs> because that's not the true use that I had for these penises. That sounded dirty, I didn't mean it that way. Uh, but I usually don't put any kind of uh, strategies or barometers on what I do. I just like making the work. But I also think that you ought to tell people, you know, because when I put together various shows to um, sell work, um, what what is the price range? You know, not everybody can afford the, the extravaganza of your work. The extravaganza. Uh, it sounds like... Uh... What's the name of the uh, the gay guy with the big hair who has his own show? RuPaul. This is very RuPaulish extravaganza. Well, I have a very totalitarian idea about jewelry work. I used to sell earrings for five dollars, but I don't now. I the cheapest are ten. People would come to around me, and these were the folks that I went to school with, who were teachers, who were doing the most amazing jobs but would never be able to afford a necklace that costs $15,000, that costs $30,000. And yes, that's how much they cost. I've been working for over 50 years. They better cost more than $3. But that doesn't mean that I should not remember those folks who I hang out with and hung out with and having a good time. So I make a jewelry that's $50, $100, probably no more than $300 at the very most. And that's because I've used some real amber or something. It not only allows people to have a piece of Joy Scott work and be in on the mix with all the other artists, but a $5 or $10 pair of earrings is a way to teach kids to buy art. And so they'll buy a pair of earrings for their mom. They'll give her the $10 right back mm -hmm. as a jewelry piece. Mm -hmm. But they mm -hmm. understand more and more mm -hmm. about the procedure that happens when you are supporting an artist. Uh, that's really very important to me. Another interesting question. Do you believe that there is a responsibility uh, that the wearer should assume when they put on a piece of your work, let's say of the more elaborate station? No, no, I, I don't feel that way because it will come to them. They may not feel they have the responsibility. If you put on something that's so amazingly gorgeous, you're going to be in a mix. People will, and this is not just my work, this is anybody's work. People are going to come up and say, that's beautiful. What's it made out of? Oh, is that the end word? What's going on? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I usually don't put those kind of parameters on people because I have no way of making sure they're going to do it. What do I know? They bought it, it's now theirs. And I just hope they don't tear it up. 
Now, someone asked the question about Buddha and Harriet Tubman and how you made that transference. How did you do that projection? I think, and I hope the Buddhists understand that I mean this with great respect, that he is a universalist and that his thing was for all people to be enlightened if they would follow a certain basic rules. And I thought that there was really no one who had submitted to this urge for freedom, not only for herself, but for others and who enlightenment had come more than Harriet Tubman. Uh, she didn't have to do that, you know. When she ran away, she could have stayed away, but she kept going back. And what some people don't know is that she had a head injury as a kid. So she had seizures or, or problems, headaches, the whole thing. Did that stop her? No. She said to the government, I'll be a spy. I'll, she went, she was like a spy. Come on, folks. I don't know how more enlightened can you get? And so that's why. Now that's that thing. Now the artist in me is also like, what can I do to not only bring power to this figure, but make people to, uh, really starving hungry to know what's happening and to make ideas in their own head and figure out how can I, uh, you know, lambast somebody? How do I get somebody in there? And that is to take different desperate, uh, disparate, sometimes uneven kinds of ideas and smoosh them together and see what happens. And I've had work where I've done it and it's failed. And when the exhibition was over, I take that back and cut it up and make something else out of it. Yes. What is the lifeline of some of your work uh, going to that point about cutting it up? How do you feel when you have had a piece that you've made for a while and it has not either sold or you look at it and you feel it's not resonating with the same kind of messaging? You have no qualms about cutting it up, breaking it down, re it reforming it? Well, sometimes you can't do it easily. Yeah. And so it's generally an additive thing instead of a cut up thing. Okay. But with beadwork, it, it's very easy to do that in many cases. And I had to realize that sometimes I would be questioning and forcing something to be what it wasn't. There's this Eminem commercial about, uh, I think it's Eminem brownies or something. And Eminem <laughs> is like, why won't you go with it? Okay, I knew exactly who that Eminem was at that time. And it was because I was asking that piece to be what it was not. I really should have been writing a story or making up a song or doing something else. So because of that, I work on more than one piece at once. And I may look at something and say, this whole section is wrong. And I try to take it out or add something that connects it better or do something else. And no, I don't have a lot of problems generally with cutting up beads and some fiber work because I am that good. Now, I know how that sounds. See, I even got the finger, I am that good. But I'm 72 and I started doing bead work when I was five. If I don't know how to do it now, well, come on. So I haven't lost that that part of me that says, yeah, I can do it. I'll make it work. I am that good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And why else am I on the earth to be, am I supposed to be a, medi a mediocre bead worker? I am supposed to be striving to be the best one. That's my, my parents didn't work at these jobs and be horribly treated by people and well-treated by others. My grandparents didn't like grab 500 pound bags of cotton to be weighed when I can't even pick up a designer bag, come on. I come from a background, a history, as we all do, I'm talking about my own personal experience, where I cannot settle for that because people died for me to be here now. When you put that in the mix, 
that people died for you, then I, I won't settle for mediocre. Now, people laugh with my prints sometimes in painting and think, you need to work more. Okay, I'm going to get better at that too. Okay, we're coming to the end of our time together with this audience. Already? Maybe, not yet. I'm not quite finished with you yet. Have shadow puppets? And no I puppets, no juggling. puppets, no puppets. We're going to fast forward. We're going to fast forward. Where do you see the artwork that is being produced now? Uh oh. There's a rise in elements of what is called Afrofuturism, which really goes back to the 50s with Sun Ra or Afro, Afro futurism with a, a more African emphasis. Uh, narrative and figurative work is becoming very, very um, more pronounced in terms of how it is telling the stories and, I, and dealing with agency and identity. So what, what, what do you project? What do you see coming in the future? You know, speculation. Listen, I'm a bit flummoxed. I remember talking to our girls group, the girls of Baltimore, and I think we were talking and, and Lowry Sims, because I said, I don't know, is this like the 70s when, you know, black people were popular and then Native Americans were popular. We all had on our, you know, fringe and bead work and then Polish embroideries. I mean, and she said, I believe this is not like that. This is a correction. Now, if we're in the time of correction for African-American artists and other, all artists, but let's specifically talk about my ethnic group because that's what I know I believe the most mm -hmm. about. If we're going to be exhibited fairly, paid fairly, and have work written about us that really talks about us in a broad universalist way, not only about taking what's been written about us before and you know regurgitating it and adding a smidge of this and that, then that's a true correction. If museums and galleries are going to sell the work and museums are going to get the work and actually show it, then that's a true, a true correction. And if the new curators and directors who are being sought after and employed now get to keep jobs and get to have power within their jobs, then that's a true correction. And I hope that what is what's going to happen. Uh, I don't know about the artwork. There's a lot of uh, portraiture going on now. And I'm thinking, I got to make a whole bunch of, if I, if I need money, I better start making some black portraits. And there's a lot of Afro and African futurism going on. That's what always, I think, happens when young people start looking at stuff they hadn't heard about or didn't know or think they can bring something zesty and real to, that's going to happen. I think that us living in the 21st century with such ease of technology is going to allow people to be much more global in their thoughts. But I, I think this is an important time to look at what just happened in our capital and what is happening politically in the United States and around the world. Mm -hmm. Because all of these corrections may not be making the difference we want if we as people aren't up to the task of enlightenment, evolution, and change. And that's a big thing to ask because introspection is a biatch. Being able to look at oneself and change, it's a big one. And I can tell you, I have, been blessed with being able to do artwork and the artwork makes me question who I am. So when I say, what do I want to do in the future? It's like to be a, a mensch, a real human being, uh, a real human being who goes beyond my weaknesses. If these corrections can help that happen, I'm, I'm there. I'm still though a little trepidatious, a little not exactly sure as we as humans are ready for it yet. But it doesn't matter because it's going to happen whether we're ready or not. True. Young True. people are going to say, well, I'm, I'm going to do it. True. True. Last question from the chat room. 
someone wanted to know, were you ever influenced by the bead craze in the 60s and 70s? Sure, I was one of the uh, progenitors of that. I literally was, and I can say that because there was a, a finite group of people who were learning and teaching it. And then we had lots of students who went off and opened shops, made a lot of earrings and a lot of other stuff. Mm -hmm. And then that group called down to the folks who were making and who were employing beadwork as a language. That be those people still exist today. There are many fewer of us also because we're older now. So a couple of us have uh, gone over already. Uh, and beadwork isn't what it used to be. I look at it and it's a lot of it is back to hobbyism, hobbyist and, you know, handicrafting. That's fine because mm -hmm. sometimes you just want to feel the bead. You don't want to talk about the world and make it most a giant work. But mm -hmm. there are scholars now of beadwork and there are people who started it who are still pushing it. So, yes, girl, in the 60s and 70s, I look good. I have my braids and beads, jewelry and beads, garments and beads, installation with beads, performance with beads. beads. That's it. I probably had bead milkshakes. I did everything. <laughs> okay, last words as we close this out. What are your recommendations for those young artists and their futures and what you see they should be focusing on? Never stop. Okay, so you don't get to do everything you want to do this very second. Never stop. I had a, a kind of, uh, you know, blessed life because I left school with no loans to pay. And it was that period where you could hop on a plane and go to Africa for $300. You know what I mean? Right. Those are not right. the same anymore. But I never stopped. Never stopped. And when times get hard and people jump on you because of your ethnicity or your gender, your hairstyle or whatever else, know that you are equipped to do exactly what you knew, need to do to make your work. It won't maybe all happen at once, but don't believe them and don't stop. Mm -hmm. That maybe is why you're here, to be that person who kicks arse and works through all of that to make the most wonderful thing. I mean, when we talk about Amy, Amy, who did the painting. Cheryl. Of the Amy, Amy Cheryl. Amy Cheryl. She had a heart transplant. She did not stop. That's right. Look what she is now. We can talk right. about so many artists who, who did that. And so I say, don't stop. Have your children. Be happy with them. Maybe you don't make a, I, I'm very prolific. Maybe you don't make 50 pieces a year. Maybe you make three. But boy, are they the three pieces that you should have made. Never stop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank Julie you. Scott, thank you so much. Thank Crystal you, Les Bridges. It was a pleasure. Thank you Doesn't so Crystal much. Doesn't Crystal Bridges sound like a stripper? We're closing out, Joyce. I'm Say not a stripper. Music. Say good night. <laughs>